Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the fifth Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar. Uh, we really appreciate that you continue supporting these webinars and have all followed our new registration process and presentation format, which allows us to nearly eliminate the risk of unwanted participants interrupting the talks. Please feel free to contact us with any feedback on this new format afterwards. These webinars are hosted by Sebastian Geiger of Heriot Watt and myself from TU Delft. And we are especially grateful to our keynote speakers who have joined and supported this initiative. We are all proud of being members of the global geoscience community. And please do uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and help us spread the word. Now to the lecture of this week. Our keynote speaker of this week is Professor Inga Bere, who is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Bergen in Norway. Her research interests span many applications within the geoscience and geoenergy field, especially geothermal energy. Inga has obtained all her degrees from Bachelor of Science to PhD in Mathematics from the University of Bergen, where she is uh, today a professor as well. Well, to be honest, she has not been always at the University of Bergen, but also spent two weeks at the University of Oslo as, as a guest uh, scientist as well. Uh, she has received a number of awards, uh, among which Laureate Meltzer Prize for Young Researchers from the University of Bergen in 2011 can be mentioned. Also, uh, very uh, nicely, uh, the Reservoir Mechanics Group where, uh, at University of Bergen has received the highest mark, which is the Mark V, in National Evaluation of Norwegian Research in Mathematics. So that's quite an achievement. Uh, Inga has been a member of the Norwegian Academy of Technological Sciences since 2017. And she is currently the first deputy manager of the board of the university at the University of Bergen. After uh, finishing her role and service as the board member of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. She's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of SFB 1313 program at the University of Stuttgart and many more. Just to name two more, she is the elected chair of the joint program Geothermal of the European Energy Research Alliance and Scientific Evaluation Panel member of the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany in Leipzig. She has been and is active in the committees of many scientific in events, including Interpor, International Society of Poros Media, Gordon Research Conference, InnoMath, and European Geothermal Congress. She has led a number of research programs and advised many, many students with highly impactful publications as listed in her Google Scholar page. In short, she is a clear example of women in science, women in leadership, and women in mathematics. So we are very much proud of her. It's our pleasure and honor to host her as our keynote speaker this week. Please note her lecture will last for about 30 minutes. Well, Inga, 31 minutes would be fine as well. So don't feel so uh, obliged to finish it in 30 minutes. And then followed by questions and discussions. And like before, please type in your questions in the chat room and Sebastian will chair the discussion session afterwards. So Inga, the stage is yours and thank you very much again to accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you, Hari. I, I'm really impressed by all this information you managed to dig up about me, but well, thanks uh, for a yeah, very nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. I think this is a great initiative by Hari and Sebastian, so it was not difficult to accept when I was as to speak, uh, although I have to say I feel that I'm in a really good company in, in this webinar series, so uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I wanted to talk today about injection-induced deformation of fractured, fractured subsurface formations. Uh, this is 
uh, overall a um, topic which has interested me for quite some time, particularly related to uh, stimulation of fractured reservoirs and modeling of uh, the related processes. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I will say a little bit about yeah, how, how does this occur? What are the challenges in modeling? What can we gain from modeling and uh, so forth? So thanks again for inviting me. So how can we uh, you know, see or feel that the subsurface is deforming? And, and why does this happen? due to human uh, activity. Well, uh, humans, we do really uh, impact the subsurface and deform it through fracking, through conventional oil and gas, through production of geothermal energy, uh, reservoir stimulation, subsurface energy storage, wastewater disposal and CO2 sequestration, just to name a few. All these applications involve um, injection and also extraction of fluids and this affects um, uh, the mechanical, the hydraulical, the thermal and the chemical state at depth causing uh, interactions with the structure. Now uh, I show here a figure where I illustrate some of the deformations that we can um, monitor uh, or even see or feel. So for instance, uh, the, if we inject fluids, the uh, surface might rise. This has been observed in, in SALA related to CO2 storage. We, uh, there can be uh, sinkholes occurring due to extraction of fluids. Uh, this has occurred in, in Texas related to oil and gas. We can see earth subsidence and we can also see or we can monitor seismicity due to reactivation of subsurface uh, faults. Uh, this can occur directly because we inject fluids which causes elevated pressure in the fault which um, uh, decreases its frictional resistance to, to slip. And an abrupt slip, that's a seismic event, which we can monitor or even feel as an earthquake in, in some cases. This can happen directly as a consequence of pressure increase in the fault, but it can also happen indirectly because the loading conditions, now I will see if my cursor works, the loading conditions on the fault changes due to injection or production from a nearby aquifer. So already at this point we can see that the processes that are going on are quite complex. They interact and they interact with the structure of the formation. Now uh, this type of human-induced deformation of the subsurface, the manifestation of this in terms of induced earthquake has really grown the last decade. And uh, it's interesting if you look at the induced earthquakes database, you can really go in and see where does this occur or where do the recorded events occur, not everything is recorded. And they have done a really good job in, um, in um, gathering information about induced earthquakes and the projects they are related to. So mainly uh, for the reported events, the projects that induce earthquakes are related to fracking, but also mining activity, water reservoir impoundment, conventional oil and gas, geothermal and waste fluid disposal cause uh, induced seismicity and earthquakes. I will mainly concentrate on uh, induced uh, seismicity caused by hydraulic stimulation of fractured reservoirs in this talk. So this uh, hydraulic stimulation is what we can call deliberately induced deformation and reactivation of faults uh, or propagation of fractures to enhance reservoir permeability. So, Hydraulic stimulation is done in both oil and gas and geothermal to enhance the reservoir connectivity and improve production. This, there are mainly two important mechanisms in hydraulic stimulation. One is what we can call hydraulic, uh, hydraulic fracturing, 
or uh, where we really create new fractures with high fluid pressures or thermal shock. If you inject really, really cold fluids in a hot uh, geothermal reservoir, you can also be, see thermal cracking. Now, uh, permeability can also be um, enhanced by stimulating pre-existing fractures. So if you have a pre-existing fracture under in an anisotropic stress regime, in increasing fluid pressure can cause this fracture to slip. If, the, if this fracture is in hard rock, when it slips, it will also have to dilate and this creates flow paths. Of course, there can also be a mix between these two mechanisms where, for instance, you, the uh, slip of fracture induce wing cracks um, at the tips of this um, fracture that shares. So I will mainly focus on this shear stimulation. And if I have time, I will say a little bit about mixed mechanism stimulation in the end. So uh, just to reiterate, what we see in shear dilation is that, uh, or this will occur if we have large differences between maximum and minimum horizontal stress typically. Prior to the injection of fluid, the situation is stable due to friction between fracture surfaces. But when we inject fluid at elevated pressure, this overcomes the frictional resistance to slip and the pressure will slip and dilate. This is a mechanism which is deliberately induced in, hydro in hydraulic stimulation because there is a, um, sorry, this is my phone. I didn't think about that. We'll just turn it off. Sorry. So, <laughs> I'm not used to this format. So yeah, you have to excuse me. So where was I? Yes. So this is uh, and this so this is deliberately induced to enhance permeability. And in lab experiments and also in mesoscale experiments in the field, they really show that this can enhance permeability orders of magnitude. So it's an effective way of increasing reservoir permeability. The figures to the right are, are show results from an underground experimental facility uh, located in southeastern France, where they stimulated a fault at, a, um, at the depth of, I think the probe was at 282 meters. And these type of mesoscale experiments can really show how the fault will dilate and open as a consequence of uh, enhanced fluid pressures. Uh, so for geothermal, this type of mechanisms are really useful if we want to improve reservoir permeability, which is done for enhanced geothermal systems. To utilize deep geothermal resources, we need sufficient heat, fluid and permeability, but in many cases this is not in place. Still, if we have a lot of heat in place, uh, we can create or enhance the permeability by hydraulic stimulation and also re-inject fluid to, for pressure support and to ensure that we, um, we can produce at good rates. Now, for ETS, there has been some cases of um, in, uh, hydraulic stimulation causing induced seismicity to a level which is um, unacceptable. And this really ca caught my interest uh, several years ago. And the uh, interesting case was a case in 2006 in Basel, Switzerland, where they uh, stimulated a geothermal reservoir. Uh, but then at some point, and I will see now if, you can sh if I can show my cursor, you can see here, this is um, well pressure here in black and you have magnitude and uh, seismic events here in, uh, in blue. Now, uh, after some days of stimulation, they realized that the, um, or it could be monitored more and more seismicity, which is sort of expected, but at some point the uh, magnitudes became too high. So uh, it was decided to shut in the well. 
So this happens after, uh, as you can see here, it's illustrated with, with this line. And you would, you know, intuitively, you would expect this to, that the seismicity then would decrease. And it did decrease, but before it decreased, they observed the highest magnitude event of 3.4 after the well was shut in. Also, uh, even months after the, um, uh, after the bleeding of the well, uh, uh, seismic events of magnitude, several seismic events of magnitude 3 were observed. And uh, so, so this shows that there are really complex things going on. And, and that it's, uh, yeah, and I, I got curious of whether this was possible to understand better through modeling. Also later in 2017, a, a seismic event a thousand times stronger than the Basel case was in, induced in Pohang in South Korea related to a uh, stimulation of a geothermal reservoir. In this case, the 5.4 5.4, uh, 5.5 magnitude event happened two months after the stimulation. So, uh, and what is, um, and this has been analyzed, and what is, uh, and the investigation suggests that there were small earthquakes, which were deliberately induced to stimulate the reservoir, that activated a fault, which was previously unknown, and which finally ruptured in this 5.5 earthquakes. This, uh, this case from Pohang shows that fault reactivation is sensitive, extremely sensitive to pre-existing tectonic conditions on the fault. And it also uh, shows that previous hypotheses that maximum earthquake magnitudes are governed by volume of injected fluid are not necessarily, uh, it's, not, um, it's not correct. This, so, there are complex mechanisms going on here, and also uh, the, the um, pre-existing tectonic conditions and structures, uh, which are to a large extent unknown, are really um, important in terms of uh, how deformations and fault reactivation uh, will proceed. So uh, this is sort of a long introduction, but it uh, brings me to the point where we can just say a little bit about what are the challenges in modeling injection-induced deformation. So one, uh, as was the case for the Wuhan uh, earthquake, is lack of data. We know that pre-existing tectonic conditions and structures are really governing these processes, but to a crucial extent, they are un unknown. If we just uh, look back at this figure I had earlier, we know that there are lots of coupled processes going on, and there is also what I like to call process structure interaction, where processes affect the structure. So fracture networks, for instance, uh, they fractures are deformed due to these processes, and at the same time, these complex structure or fracture networks, they really dominate the processes. So you have this interaction between processes and structure um, uh, all the time, which is difficult to model. Also, which processes that governs this deformation may change in time? For instance, for geothermal, you, uh, in many cases, fluids are re-injected for pressure support. This can result in long-term cooling, which it can compress the, the rock and result that the loading on fracture changes, which again can result in slip. So uh, this is, there are definitely many, many challenges that makes these uh, dynamics extremely difficult to model. So when it comes to predictive capabilities, there will always be, I would say, extreme limitations, but still modeling can reveal really important mechanism and forecast causality, which is crucial to design injection processes and also to avoid an acceptable environmental impact. And I think there is, um, you know, the last years there has been really uh, good work done in the research community to improve capabilities in modeling but still i think there is it's really 
an area where challenges are um, particularly strong and and it really needs a lot of effort still so so i hope uh, i hope also this is something which in, it will interest a lot of um, researchers uh, and more researchers in in the future so uh, i will now just give some examples of uh, modeling that uh, we have done in berlin and i will just start by a simple case just illustrating what we examples of what we can study and what we can learn from doing numerical modeling. So uh, there will just be uh, synthetic cases in, in this talk, uh, and but I will say a little bit about our plans related to field experiments as well. So the first case is a study that we did some years ago uh, based on a very, I would say, simplified model. We modeled a structure uh, with 20 fractures that um, uh, are in a porous media domain. So we model both the dynamics related to the fractures, but also how the matrix surrounding these explicitly represented fractures respond to uh, both the formation of the fractures, but also uh, it, it flow and, and deformation. So, uh, the, the first uh, case we, um, I will show you is we were interested in what is the effect of the matrix probability. We know we have flow in both fractures and matrix, but the flow in the matrix will be small because the fractures in many cases are much more permeable. So uh, you could think that you might just neglect the flow in the matrix and only model flow in the fractures. Now, we looked a little bit into this. And we see that uh, we did two cases where everything was the same, except that we, in the case you see to the left, we had half the permeability as in the case you see to the right. And if we model a um, hydraulic stimulation of this reservoir, the gray line here is the well, and we only show here the fracture network, you can see that, um, when you have a lower permeability, you build up more pressure, or lower matrix permeability, you build up more pressure in the fracture, which leads to a more uh, slip, dilation, and permeability enhancement. So this is, I guess, rather intuitive. It's, uh, you have, uh, why, because in this case, you will have less leakage from, matrix, from fracture to matrix, while in the case to the right, it leaks more into the matrix and this you don't build up the same amount of pressure and you will also have less uh, stimulation. So this sort of shows that uh, neglecting the matrix will not really work uh, in modeling these dynamics. Another case we, we looked at is um, this case of post-injection seismicity. And here we, we uh, looked at the effect of aperture or elastic aperture changes. So when you, um, when you increase pressure, you will push the fracture a little bit open and decrease pressure. It will relax a little bit. We modeled this with a Barton Bandis model. We also modeled the slip and dilation of the fracture. Now, we um, then tested, and this shows a, uh, a numer numerical results where you, for a um, stimulation of a fracture reservoirs, the dots here, they are proxies for seismic events, and the colors here, they show um, aperture changes. So in this case, we only simulated uh, the slip and dilation of fracture due to um, the pressure increase, while in what I will show you in uh, up here, we also included this more elastic effect of uh, fracture aperture opening and closing elastically as a consequence of fluid pressure. What our hypothesis was that if we uh, allow for this effect, what will happen when the well shuts in is that 
the fascia will re relax and close a little bit, and that this will push fluid further into the reservoir, potentially uh, reactivating more uh, faults and leading to seismicity. And this was uh, exactly what we saw. So in the top row, we include this effect, and we see after shutting more seismicity than in the lower row. So this is another example of the type of mechanism you can investigate with numerical modeling. Although this case is, of course, far from the real situations, and the model that we used for this case has also strong limitations. So we have later worked on improving our modeling. And uh, I will now, so I'm giving this talk sort of a bit back. I'm starting with some examples, and now I want to say a little bit about how we go about when doing the numerical modeling, and then I will show some examples again. So uh, how do we go about? Well, if we have a, a, um, a fracture reservoir, a geothermal reservoir in this case, that we, uh, and we want to model the fluid injection, we need to both model the structure of the reservoir and the processes that goes on. So we need to choose a conceptual model for the structure, given that we know that the original fracture porous medium is very complex and we cannot uh, really grasp all details. What, and there are many different conceptual models to model fracture reservoirs. We chose to do what we call a discrete fracture matrix model, where we, we say that we can model some fractures explicitly, while other finer scale fractures needs to be integrated in the matrix continuum somehow. So, uh, but this means that at least you can look at the facts of dominating fracture structures, while also accounting for flow and deformation of possibly heterogeneous surrounding matrix. So this is our conceptual model for the uh, fracture reservoir. And then we also need to model processes. Now, I mentioned previously that we have uh, hydraulic, uh, mechanical, thermal, and chemical processes. But just to simplify a bit, and um, I will here only consider hydraulic and mechanical processes. So uh, we will need to look uh, to model fluid flow and possibly thermal transport in fractures and matrix. I see here I included thermal because I, yeah, I will get back to that. So, okay, THM, but not C in this case. So we will model fluid flow and thermal transport in both fractures and matrix. We will model uh, the fracture deformation, so fracture contact mechanics, how the fracture slips and open. And we will model the rock mechanical deformation so that we can look at how, uh, how the rock responds to the fracture deformation and also how it responds to changes in, in temperature and fluid pressure. So thermocorelasticity for the matrix uh, in this case. Now, as I mentioned, just to reiterate, what also makes this difficult is that we now have this process structure interaction because these processes to the right, um, they, uh, they affect the structure to the left. So this structure to the left that we're modeling, this structure, we need to allow uh, the fractures to open Possibly, and I will not show this for, I will see if I have time to show this, possibly also propagation of fractures. So this makes this a very challenging modeling problem. To uh, deal with this, we uh, do what we call mixed dimensional modeling. So we can consider the matrix as three dimensional, while the fractures that live in the matrix, they are two dimensional surfaces. If fractures intersect, the intersections will be one-dimensional lines. And if we have inter intersections of intersections, that will be a point illustrated in, in red here. So, uh, and it, you can also see here to the right. So we have 3D matrix, 
2D fractures, 1D intersections, and 0D, that is points, intersections of intersections. Now, given this framework, uh, we can we, um, we define the objects, as you can see to the right, and their connections. And this gives rise, we'll just be a little bit quick, if we look at flow to these, uh, the following set of equations that you can see to the left. Uh, you probably recognize Darcy's law if, if for domain i, which we let's say this is the fracture domain, the equations are the same for all dimensions, uh, the way they are written. But let's just think of this as the flow equations for the fracture. We have Darcy's law, we have mass conservation, and the fracture sees its higher dimensional neighbors as a source term, which is given here, and it sees its lower dimensional neighbors, given by this equation, through a boundary condition. So, uh, and this uh, boundary condition is defined by the flux between the subdomains, which is given by a robot type interface condition. The transfer of the variables between the domains is given by projection uh, operators. So in this way, we can, uh, if we are in the interface, we can tell whether you should pick variables from the higher dimensional matrix or the, the lower dimensional fracture. Now, if we move on just to uh, show you an example, we can then model uh, the processes in the different domains. And this is completely coupled. So for instance, this is just an example simulation run showing concentration in the fractures and concentration in the matrix in a uh, case where uh, fluid is injected in this upper uh, left corner of the figure. So this was flow. But we also want to couple this with mechanics and I will not have time to go into the details, but in principle, we, we handle this uh, similarly, except that for mechanics, we need to deal with the fracture, the mechanics of the fractures in particular. So uh, for mechanics, we model the medium as uh, linearly elastic uh, and uh, for the fractures, we model the contact mechanics by column friction. So this gives us how uh, the fractures will, uh, will deform. And the lambda you can see here, this is a contact uh, traction. So um, we can easily represent shear and normal forces on the fracture surfaces when we uh, we use a discretization based on a uh, well a cell-centered finite volume method which is called the mpsa method yes um uh, i think i will just move on uh, for the sake of time uh, if we just show a, a case here uh, this is pure mechanics still. We have some fractures. We fix the domain in the bottom and we apply uh, forces on the top. And this will cause the fractures, and I, it's just illustrated, emphasized here with color, to slip uh, and open. And the fractures that are still sticking, they are illustrated in green. Now, um, we can also add fluid to this. Uh, so then the um, stress will become an effective stress, so the, the, um, which is the mechanical stress minus the fluid pressure. So I have illustrated the effects of fluid here in blue. So this gives extra terms to the equations, extra coupling. And we can run the same test case. Uh, and if we here uh, start out with the situation we had from before, we just 
fixing the domain to the bottom and applying shear forces. And then we inject fluid from the left. You can see here how this affects the deformation of the fracture. So uh, fractures that were previously sticking, they will start to slip, as you can see here in red. And, and even uh, fractures that were previously uh, had uh, slipped, they might start to, to open, as you can see with this fracture number two here. The next uh, we can add in terms of processes are uh, thermal effects. This gives, uh, again, modified equations where uh, the thermal effects are shown in red. And uh, we can still, again, run a similar test case where we show, in the first case, the only the mechanical effects we just displace the, the boundary at forces and this will deform the fractures they start to slip which is red and open which is blue if we then apply a, a pressure gradient uh, from left to right you can see that uh, the fracture for instance um, this fracture number one here which was in stick mode this will start to slip because the increased pressure decreases its frictional strength. Uh, again, we can, with the same domain, uh, check what will happen if we start to cool from the left. This will contract the rock even more, so it reduces the load on the fracture, and we can see that the fracture uh, opens. Uh, that the fracture which was previously um, slipping now go into opening mode so there is no contact uh, we have also so this is sort of just a case to see how the different processes affect the deformation of the fractured medium and this is work done by Ivar Stefansson who is a PhD student in in Bergen so I just uh, and he has also investigated the 3D, a 3d case in this case, um, we have three fractures. Injection is done in the fracture all the way to the left, while production is done in fracture number two here in the center. And we can see, let me see if I can, yeah, this is a video uh, which shows the magnitude of the tangential displacement. So this video shows how the fracture slips due to the uh, increase of pressure, this pressure here to the left. And we also, at late stages, we can start to see some, I, I guess it's difficult to see in this figure, uh, some also um, a deformation of the fracture to the right, which, which then is also due to cooling of the formation. So um, this is just examples of how uh, numerical simulations can be used to investigate the dynamics when uh, re resulting from, from fluid injection. We have started to look a little bit into how we can combine this with field observations, and we work with seismologists to investigate uh, stimulation of a geothermal uh, reservoir at Reichenest where they injected, uh, where they stimulated a, a well and also monitored the seismic events. So in this case, we can build models of the uh, reservoir with the faulty structure uh, and investigate how the, um, these, um, how the um, uh, enhanced fluid pressure uh, results in reactivation of, of the faults, and we can then compare this with actual observations of the seismic events. And the hope is that this type of modeling, this type of modeling can be used to improve the analysis of the seismic data and vice versa, that the seismic data can be used to improve the models. 
So we don't do any predictions here, but we try to see if we can mimic the actual observations. So how am I doing with respect to time? I guess I should. You up. have you have uh, five more minutes. As I well. have five minutes. Okay, I I thought I was I was doing even worse. Yeah. Um. Yes. We also do. We have also uh, started working on um this type of mixed mechanism stim stimulation because we know that sharing slip or fractures will induce ring cracks at the tips at, at the fracture tips but it's difficult to say how important this mechanism is in um, hydraulic reservoir stimulation so uh, we would really like to also include this uh, these dynamics in modeling of the uh, fracture reactivation and slip and uh, how to Zhongdang, which is a PhD student, he has started to work on this using um, finite element methods. And yeah, we will. I will just show quickly some uh, very preliminary results uh, where he has looked into a 2D domain which is being shared. And you can see that depending on the amount of, of shared displacement of the domain, the fracture, the wing cracks will, will propagate from existing uh, fractures. So this would, of course, be really nice to combine with the, the modeling of um, fluid injection and slip due to elevated fluid pressures. But we'll see what we can do. OK, so uh, just to summarize, what can we do with this type of modeling? Well. Uh, at this point, predictions are really hard due to the causes that I already mentioned, lack of data, etc. But we can uh, identify relevant processes dominating important mechanisms in in the dif that cause deformations. We can look into causality. For instance, if fluid injection cause, we, causes a fault to slip, what will the effect be on nearby faults? Uh, and we, in some situations, I think it's also possible to do some forecasting. But this requires a rigorous approach to mathematical modeling and solution strategies, and also verification and validation to the extent possible. I did not really dig now into the maths of, of uh, this modeling, but um, it is... I, there are, of course, different levels of coupling in the mathematical modeling. And what you see in these processes is that they are, ex the couplings are what I would say extreme. So it's really important to solve this fully coupled. And this uh, creates strong or puts really strong demands on solution approaches. So also, we need to deal with uh, lack of data and uncertainty in interpretation of data, the complexity of the subsurface, and the, really the mathematical model complexity, all these interacting dynamics result in. So there are definitely um, really uh, a lot to work on uh, related to these topics. Excellent. Now, uh, just to end, I have to acknowledge my co-workers in Bergen. So uh, really, the main work has been done by Runa, Eirik, Hau, Ivar, and, and Eran that I presented today. Uh, and uh, yeah, I should also, I have also listed other co-authors and collaborators. And I have to acknowledge the Research Council of Norway, who have supported us together with Equinor. So with that, thank you. Uh, yeah, this was very unusual to give a talk. <laughs> to Thank you very much. Yeah, that that, that was excellent. I to take questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I, we clap for you, but, but many all already doing that. Sebastian will chair the, the discussion session. So Sebastian is yours. Thank you very much, Inga, um, for an excellent talk. And the first question is actually from one of your collaborators. Um, Florian is asking, how much do you rely on similar discretization concepts for the individual physics? Do you rely on finite volume methods or would it be possible to couple in different discretization concepts? 
Yes, uh, we have relied on finite volume methods, uh, both for mechanics and flow, but it's definitely uh, possible to to couple. I mean, it's I uh, I put the reference, but it's also worth mentioning the work at uh, at Stanford with Hamdi Shlepi's group uh, and also uh, uh, a paper by Garipov and Hu, where they, uh, I, if I remember correctly, they do coupling of finite elements for mechanics and and finite volumes for flow. This has also been done by Ruben Juanes for uh, investigation of fault reactivation. He coupled a, a code earthquake type code pilot with with um, finite volumes for flow. So so. Uh, as long as you take care with with the coupling, this is um, this is also a possibility. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from one of um, Florent's colleagues, Andreas Busch. Again, excellent talk. Many thanks. How difficult will it be to model coupled hydromechanics in layered strata, where the properties are changing on the scale of centimeters or meters? Oh. Um, I mean, with the modeling approach we do now, we can do heterogeneity and we can also do an isotropy in the matrix. That's with these, with the MPFA method for flow and the MPFA, uh, although we, it, we've not really digged into that. When it comes to like resolving, I mean, we the one of the problems with the fractures is that they have this, um, um, the ratio between the their extent and their width is extremely small and we handle this with this mixed dimensional modeling so if it's like a thin layer that we can model in the same way i think that's uh that is for sure possible but to the extent we can resolve these problems i mean the, we really need to choose because also in terms of computational power and yeah, the solver capabilities, uh, there are strong limitations. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. Thank and you. I can't say because <laughs> he wrote it, yeah. Um, so the next question is from Omar Duran Triana. He has actually a very nice comment to start with, thanking you for an excellent talk. His question is, how does the inelastic process rock plasticity affect an induced seismicity study? Are they really relevant? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in terms of, um, I mean, it's really seen that the ice, ice seismic slip, which precedes seismic slip, is important in in um, in fault rupture and, and uh, and how it develops, and there are lots of. I have to say, I'm not really, I'm not an expert on how this works, but uh, this diff. I mean, the the different types of of the deformation of the fault, especially in initial stages, are uh, definitely important to to grasp. I mean, the fault is not behaving elas uh, elastically. The, the fault is when it slips this this is a uh, i would say it's more elastoplastic when it sticks together that's elastic but then it slips and that sort of correspond to to plasticity somehow and there are also other sort of intermediate stages where it's more creeping so so uh, and all this is um i've not really seen this it can i've seen this to some extent mimicked in model by by adapting uh, more advanced friction models, for instance, on faults. But in the work we have done up to not till now, we have just used very simple friction models. But we have more concentrated on uh, on solving the couplings. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Shanko Yogi. Thank you, Inga, for the wonderful talk. Talk. Do you think that along with the pre-existing structures, pre-existing pore pressure distributions also control fluid migration direction away from the injection well? Pre-existing structures are definitely important. I mean, they they control uh, they control a lot of the the fluid pressure migration, and also. Uh, well, existing fluid pressure, 
yes i mean this will have an impact uh, you you could think of different type of of regimes in the subsurface with with um yeah so yes but i think the important uh, thing that we show here is that in my view this idea of radial pressure diffusion which has been a lot that has been sort of used a lot in, in uh, analysis and explanation of seismicity is not really functioning so well if you also, I mean, if you think about these complex structures, you can really see that there is, if you have a fracture reservoir, the, you, don't re, you don't have a radial pressure diffusion from the well. It's, it's strongly affected by the structures and the fracture structures. So, uh, so, and and uh, so this also means that it's like this hypothesis which have been relied on much before that you can control seismicity by controlling injected volumes is also uh, is also yeah not good because the structures and the pre-existing sort of uh, tectonic conditions are uh really affect how the faults are or will behave and how they will react to to even small um increases in pressure thank you um we have a question from uh novikov hello inga um, have you considered rate state friction laws in the model you presented does friction coefficient remain constant and drops to zero since the criterion has reached has been reached um this is a good question we have not looked into more advanced friction models i i uh, i know there are several researchers in this field who do modeling who all, they have also done uh rate and state uh, i think uh, yeah ruben Hannes at mit he has done done work on this but uh, I, uh yeah so so these friction models we have considered so far are very much simplified uh so yeah uh, but yes other friction models would uh, could definitely result in better modeling and then i'm also especially thinking about this uh, yeah how the uh, this um how the slip changes from the initial deformation uh, to the more abrupt slip and things like this, which is extremely important in earthquake modeling. But um, yeah, we have yeah we have only considered a simplified uh, model. But yes, definitely important aspect. Thank you, Daniel Wong has a very simple question: Is crack propagation a possibility in reality? Crack propagation? Yes, I would say. Yes, you can see this by looking at outcrops, uh, even for instance, these wind cracks, that a crack propagation, crack, tensile crack propagation can uh, of course happen if you, if you do hydro fracking with, with the pressure is higher than the strength of the rock. But it can also happen with lower pressures because the slip of a fault will induce uh, fractures. Uh, at at the fault tip due to the stress changes related to to the slip, and this this can also be seen in nature. So I'm not a um, a geologist, but I've been shown. You know, you can see really wind cracks developing, which because of of shearing of of fractures. So I would say fracture propagation. Yes, it's. It's definitely a mechanism. How important it is? This is more. This is a different question. Will it be? Um, yeah. Uh, will it be really uh, important to enhance reservoir connectivity? Can it? Can fracture propagation connect pre-existing fractures, etc.? Um, there are studies that show that uh, fracture slip and fracture propagation interact and in creating reservoir connectivity of course depending on on the level of uh, or the um, elevation of uh, fluid pressure but but i think this is there is yeah uh, yet a lot to be investigated in terms of how these mechanisms really interact and how also the propagation changes stress which affects the the um 
further slip. So, so um, yes, this, this is um, absolutely a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next one is from Ian Kamp. With the first, oh, sorry, um, who thanks you for the, the talk and asks the Barton Bendis model is an empirical model. Large scale models require such constitutive equations. Could numerical modeling be used to simulate the micro scale to generate better constitutive relationships? Oh, excellent question. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Constitutive models. Yeah, we do rely a lot on constitutive models. Um, and uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I have seen modeling work where the sort of fine scale contact is is um, is modeled. Uh, so so you really you really model the, the contact between the rough fracture surfaces, and and uh, and then you can see this type of behavior. We have we have not. Uh, looked into this, but I think it would definitely be really interesting to see that type of, of modeling work. And uh, yeah, I mean the Barton band is that's experimental. Uh, so so to try try to mimic those type of experiments with numerical modeling, I think that would definitely be worthwhile, especially because we need to transfer from the experimental scale to the meso uh, scale. Uh, and then further to the the macro scale. I also I think it's yeah just now this is a big question, but these experiments they do in these underground laboratories. I think those are also extremely important to link from from the lab and to the the field. Great, thank you. The next question is not from Hardy. He passes on a question from Soren Pop. Um, you mentioned large variations in parameters matrix versus fractures, but the models seem to be similar in both types of medium. Medium, In case of large contrasts, should one consider different models? Um, well, we do have for flow, yes. I mean, for flow, we have for now used Darcy flow for both matrix and fractures. Of course, and um, we know that for fractures, and if you have high flow velocities and and yeah, Darcy might not work. We also have issues for multi-phase flow, for instance, that we could have to deal with. Those could be different from fracture and matrix. So yes, um, I think the uh, the um, this mixed dimensional modeling is nice in terms that it allows for different models for fractures and matrix and we utilize that in modeling of deformation where we have linear elasticity in the matrix and we have a contact mechanics model for the fractures and and this uh, and similarly we can also do a different model for for flow in in the fractures so uh, i think these questions just illustrate that there is a lot of yeah i mean there is definitely much more complexity to this problem um, that that is uh, is not integrated yet, and which could be important. Yeah. Florian is just commenting in the chat that he's working, or his group is working. <laughs> uh, yeah, I and, know. I know. It's really nice work on. on and, and Sorin asked me to thank you also for the excellent talk. Answer to flow and, and multi phase. So yeah, thank you, Sorin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think I mean really this this modeling topic. I mean we we could occupy so, so many researchers working in this field. Uh, uh, yeah, that's for sure. We have do we have time for three more questions, Hari? Great. Um, so next question is from Amir um, Hagi. Thank you for the great talk. Much appreciated. My question is, have you investigated the impact of flow and its mechanical interactions in fractures in a multi-phase system in your modeling? No, I've not done multi-phase, but uh, again, this group in, in, uh, in Stanford, uh, they have done work on multi-phase flow. Also, Dennis Vosco in, in at TU Delphi, now he does work on multi-phase flow and fractures. So, uh, yeah, we're not there yet, but others have, uh, have done good work in, in this direction. Thank you. Um, another question, we have a question from Gonzalo Calvo. Um, he asks, shear and dilation modes have been initially considered, but apparently not contraction. Do you plan to consider this? Can we expect to have to deal with mechanic discontinuities like stylolites? 
Oh, this question I actually didn't understand. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess what he's asking, um, um, are you oh, modeling protection right. processes as hmm? well? Are you are you able are you planning to put in models um, to that allow you to simulate compaction so you could look at processes like the formation of discontinuities such as stylolites? Yeah, I mean compaction. Uh, the model we um, no, we have not modeled uh, compaction processes. No. Okay, but this this is something which. Uh, yeah, this is sort of within what we can do, yeah. We have a question then from uh, Mohamed Reza Hajibadi. He asks, can we consider cyclic injections as a kind of fatigue process to increase permeability? Yes, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, there has been a lot, uh, several studies now on how to best stimulate a reservoir to enhance permeability but avoid uh, unacceptable levels of seismicity. And cyclic stimulation is, is something which has been tested also in the field so that you, you um, try to control the stimulation process um, better. With, with and, and sorry, now I forgot the question. If we could model this, uh, yes, sure. I mean, it's definitely something which. Uh, yeah, and I think it's, it's um, a, pro a process to fatigue to generate permeability. Oh, yeah. Hand over. oh no, yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't, um, uh, no, this is, this is not in the models we have. I mean, there are also type of histories, the uh, hysteresis effect in, in the fracture aperture changes and so forth, which are are not integrated here, but we which we know are there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Inga. I'm going to hand over for some closing remarks to um, Adi, and thank you everyone for the many good questions. Yes, uh, thank you all. Uh, I would like to just uh, thank again Inga for the talk and also announce our next week webinar. It will be given by uh, Mike Stephenson from British Geological Survey. Uh, Mike will talk about geological decarbonization and the transition of energy systems. Can the developing world leapfrog uh, the fossil economy? So please join us next week, the same time, 4 p.m. in European and 3 p.m. Uh, uh, in Britain. All the best and thank you all. Uh, have a nice week.